Harlem's Compact or the Mephistopheles Compact as attributed to Lawrence Harlam on the damnable visions and epiphanes of the deplorable Dr. Faustus by Darcy John Bouchard edited by Jude Jesus the third installment of our story being the second part or chapter we continue this awful story in finding ourselves once again with Faustus Satoyan de Sada and the Demoiselles Eponine and Azelma the spoiler in a chamber illuminated by a strange glowing crystal clear pool of clean smelling water with a statue of the Nayad Same CIS sitting in it, pregnant, combing her hair and gazing lovingly at her reflection. In our last chapter, Faustus was saved by Azelma's quick thinking them thence all escaped together from the terrors of Hecate Treya at the crossroads, whereof they also Cybris and the Lamia. So is it that we begin our journey together again amidst the horrid pounding of those dreadful nine naked corybants, stamping their feet and beating drums, amidst the disparaging wailing of the gully, and other wraith-like souls drawn inexplicably towards the tangled bodies of the orgiastic legion I that soulless crowd of castrated men and bloody bleeding breastless women. O oh reader! List well as to how those was all ever so weary of the persistent boredom of life within the grottoes of the bordello of the world as we bodily venture forth amidst the vilest refuse of humanity, through the cruddy scum into the presence of Sorority of the Bad Women Jezebel Faustus watched as Jezebel's pagan black slave women and children danced tribal dances in uncontrolled lust around the abominable iron image of Moloch in the furnace, whilst white men babbling Yiddish, throwing their children into Moloch's arms to be consumed by the flames which burned around him. And as these innocents cried, Moloch prayed. Black and spotted men wearing ram's horns were everywhere, big eyes rolling, drooling, and smacking their big red lips, calling each other brother and pestering any white women they encountered, singing, Black is beautiful and we are free, at long last we are free. But many of the white women the Nogkers encountered gave themselves freely, willingly to the spooks, calling them, Daddy. Then came white men dressed in white robes and hoods carrying torches, clubs, whips and ropes fashioned into nooses, beating the blacks, yelling out, Get your hands off you and my sister, or wife, or daughter. Some were yelling, How dare yo touch a white woman, nigga. Others merely cursed at or spat at the horny grossly endowed black men, who, despite of the violent opposition they were receiving, persisted in groping and pawing at the white women, poking and prodding them, having their way with them and taking pleasure with them. And, much to Faustus' chagrin, the dirty white sluts gave themselves up to the apish mannequins in abomination, both, alone and in groups, mounting and riding them, moaning and groaning and screaming, Oh fu a fuck a kkk me, daddy. Giving injury to the white women's integrity. Some of the uppity sregan were lynched by these hooded white men, who were all they while vehemently screaming out, Godam nigjie, how dare yo touch a white woman. They were beating their white women, two wives and daughters cussing and shaming them for so easily succumbing to their perverted lust. Where is thy prince, sang a choir of negres chantresses, O oh, thy well-endowed prince of slice. Mary and Shad was among them, agitating their oppression and with her was Caligula, the depraved rake acting as her pimp him at heart a whore broker from birth. The witchy whores was wearing nothing but their body leprous skin coats of flesh and shadowed by sin, herself come riding up with one foot on a bull and tea other P.O. and a stallion. The air around her was alive with the mandric screeches of a host of leche or quenching batchustic prostitutes. Abigail was there, too. Black Margareta and bald paid friars and these cuckolds desk ride aloud in a cacophonic chorus of misery, proclaiming, our wives spend the evening fornicating, and leaving us nothing but buttered buns to eat. Of all the gadam bardashery, eh. Them all unrestrained, unrestricted, going to the toilet wherever so much, as like animals, that they pleased. Minuscule fungus was growing, and wispy wind streaming stringy flung pathogenic spores into the air, microscopic, long branching filamentous umi seats and hairy rhizoids and moldy hypha. Mushrooms were also very abundant some pale some dark some large some not so some long and lean, and others stout and fat, some spongy, some slimy, 
some weepy with stinking ooze, and others with seemed very dry as if long dead. So too were their deep-bosomed goddesses there, cupping their breasts, and standing on the heads of lion-headed sphinxes. A frenzied, writhing mass of entwined bodies slithered on the floor like snakes, kissing each other indiscriminately, women kissing women and men kissing men, performing cunnilingus and fellatio together, inserting moist fingers into every orifice, pulling and pinching and scratching at each other's flesh, and there was much sodomy, the depraved mob of orgiastics oblivious to shit-stained erections, sucking on them with much ado, and the ground beneath them was wet with urine. All the while they were moaning and groaning and praising God in delight. And amongst them were transgender mortals caressing their breasts and masturbating, and scaly reptilian immortals with the heads of frogs and snakes. Faustus was mesmerized and repelled at the same time. Oh my God he said. This is not happening. It's just, it's just, so unreal. But Desada just laughed, and spanking his girl on the bum, he said, of course it's real, you fool. This is paradise, and this why I shall never leave this place. Errol Flynn was standing in the midst of a group of teenaged girls. Here and there were pools and streams of what looked and smelled like waste, shit and piss and blood. Desada, this is the bordello, abandon all hope ye who enter here. Whoa, Seth Faustus as he is pushed by Desada and pulled by the Thenardir sisters into a rocky area in the flames and exposed to the adulterer's banquet, hosted by Queen Gulnare of the sea. When they enter they find it's a body whorehouse, a rocky place covered with thorns, thistles, and briars, and consumed by fire, a cuckold's haven wherein they first see Laputan women stripping themselves of their ill-fitting star-covered garments and throwing these into the flames to partake in debauchery. It was an abode of jackals and a haunt of ostriches, wild cats and desert beasts, and hoot owls. Satyrs roamed freely, calling to one another and playing pipes. Everywhere Faustus looked there were cross-biting sluts and jilts, or gilots, robbing roguish bantlings. The Adulterer's Banquet Faustus is informed by his companions of the many banqueters reveling at the tables, alone or together in small groups, surrounded by admirers plying them with tricks, attempting to impress them with their power and influence, foremost amongst them is delicate Aspasia, a hetera noted for her ability as a conversationalist and advisor rather than merely as an physical object of beauty, attended to by Fanny Targini Tazetti. Who is Aspasia? asked Faustus. To ask questions about Aspasia, answered Azelma, is to ask questions about half of humanity. Other Hetera were present as well, Camp Aspi their queen, sat with her courtesans, Theodota and Neira, yellow-skinned Phryne Nesrit, a prophetess and priestess of Aphrodite, whose breasts arose pity, and Leontion, Pythionus, and Ties, holding a flaming torch. Rahab the Canaanite whore of Jericho, a red cord wrapped around her belly, sat with two angelic men, the Israelite Gomer, a promiscuous woman and adulteress. Salacious Theodora, an indecent wool spinner who became empress of the Byzantine Empire, Dargelia, noted for her physical beauty and endowed with grace of manners and clever of wit. Nervous Mary Magdalene, a sinful whore, the woman with the seven devils, who was periodically insane and the victim of violent epilepsy, her hair disheveled, eyes glaring, cheeks sunken, Joanna wife of Herod Stuart Shuza, called the Apostle Unia, and Susanna her myrrh-bearers, Lydia of Thyatira, a prominent woman dressed in purple robes, the Jewish Christians Priscilla, a teacher, and Achaia, companions of Paul, all of them tent-makers expelled from Rome by Emperor Claudius, sitting at one table with tax collectors, prostitutes, eunuchs, and a host of unnamed women. They debate theology and mutter prayers heard only by them. Also present, and identified by Desada, Eponine or Azelma, are, Madame Polly Adler, a Russian Jewess, Hackney Mary Bolin, a great, infamous slag, Alice Chambers, a dance hall girl who died of venereal disease and was buried in Boot Hill, Dodge City, Sheridan Ethan, Whore of the North, famous for her live sex shows in Amsterdam. All were speaking and crying out in a confusion of tongues, but, nonetheless, Faustus understood what they cried, 
and the things they were saying. Asmadu son of Nama, owner of the brothel and host of the banquet came forward to welcome them him bearing a large cornucopia frothing with white foam. Asmadu said to Faustus, Have you no joie de vivre? Not waiting nor expecting neither determined to elicit any reply from his guest, Asmodeus thrust the cornucopia into Faustus' hands, bidding him drink and be merry and forget woe. So it was that the mortal man in the bowels tasted of the warm milk of Ninhursag makes strong and immortal those who drink it. As he drank, him not understanding why a small taste, a sip, merely, had so gluttonously morphed into such an unquenchable gulping of that ambrosiac broth, an ant manifested and the more of the delicious glee he consumed, so didst she materialize more and more quick becoming flesh and blood and bone, there, at his feet, her spinning her web of dreamy satisfaction about him him unknowing yet of her manifestation thereat at his feet, whereof sat she embracing him in her cocoon of non-existence. Hence, so too didst approach he, the man, the godling arrows him but a wee-winged cherubim of a child, playing naughty naughty betwixt their feet touching their toes together his and hers. Two ways of life. Sitting at one table, upon which was the gigantic hairy horned head of Humbaba the Terrible, were Gilgamesh and his ancestor Utanapishtim, Noah, who was drunk on wine, and his friend Enkidu the wild man. They all wore robes, from which only their necks and bearded heads and hands could be seen. He was begging for his life. Laughed Enkidu, telling Utanapishtim how Gilgamesh had killed Humbaba. Then they all laughed and drank heartily. At another table, laden with sumptuous feast of lamb, on a platter, and strewn over with precious stones, string jewelry, a flute of lapis lazuli, a porphyry ring, a carnelian ring, and a timbrel, tambourine, as well as cones of burning incense, sat Dumuzid Amaukam Galana, the good, young shepherd, tear-stricken and weeping, and with him was his song-knowing sister Justin Anna the honey-mouthed lady, both were wearing purple robes. Justin Anna was lamenting, dolefully saying, Oh my brother, my brother, let me utter a lament for you. Oh my brother, my brother, let me utter a lament for you. Oh my brother, my brother, let me utter a lament for you. Dumuzid was caressing his sister's holy thighs, her skin was the color of cold water in the desert, but her eyes, face and ears were lacerated with scratches, as were her buttocks, which were revealed as he began to rape her. And, as he grabbed her and threw her onto the table, their drinking cups were knocked over to lay on their sides, with milk and ambrosia spilling out and mixing together under it all. They were quickly surrounded by small and large demons, all wielding copper pins, nails, and pokers, some had large, sharp copper axes. They were all saying, show us where your brother is. We're not here for a peep show, said Dasada to Faustus. Come along, let us find a table. Aeneas sat with his father Anchises at one table, smoke from incense burning on their table fluttered above them like two white doves. Pale Anurus, Aeneas' friend, who is dripping wet, was sitting with them also. Sitting at the same table are Odysseus and the shade of Elpener, once close friends. Faustus overheard Pale and Eurus request that Aeneas, save me from this awful doom. Elpener was saying, to Odysseus, I ask that you remember me, and do not go and leave me behind unwept, unwrapped in sepulchre, unburied for fear I might become the god's curse upon you, but burn me, with all my armor and heap up a grave mound over me besides the gray sea so that those who come will know of me. Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Psychopompus, stood behind Odysseus wearing his typical winged petsus, round helm, and winged sandals, holding a golden-winged Kikian, Caduceus, in his left hand, but otherwise he is completely naked, except for a red woolen clamus, short traveler's cloak or cape, adorned with purple stripes, clavi, around the border, being fastened with a fibula, pin, at the right shoulder and thrown casually around his neck, over his left shoulder. Hermes is the synchronistic mediator between the conscious and unconscious. Imhotep stood nearby them as well, close to Hermes, he was the physician, high priest, scribe, vizier, and architect, who built the first pyramid, 
of four pharaohs, a demigod genius who emerged from the mists of antiquity. He was clean-shaven, bald-headed, and held a papyrus roll. He was wearing a white SND weight, a type of kilt, of a fine linen byssus, woven from flax fibers, around his waist early Christian writers identified Imhotep as one with Christ. He has also been identified with Joseph son of Jacob and the Greek physician Asclepius. Baint Jadet, the lord of sexual pleasure and king of witches, representing man's most basic urges, stood beside Hermes, having, like Baphomet, two twisting spiral horns coming out the sides of his head, and a goat's face and legs. His was the face of evil, decadence and immorality. He was wearing a white SND weight around his waist, on his head was a golden solar crown, or diadem with spikes radiating out around it and a ureus, rearing cobra, in the center, and around his neck he wore a beaded wessic collar, made of tubular beads of bronze, silver and gold, and gemstones, jade, rubies, feldspar, carnelian, jasper, turquoise, and lapis, as well as stone and faience. Four bow, birds with human heads, flew around his baint jadet, Adam, who was the father of the gods, having a serpent-like appearance and wearing the chint, double crown, the tall bulbous white he jet inside the red dishrit, Shu, who separated the world into its opposites, above and below, light and dark, good and evil, who wore a braided false, punt, beard, made of goat's hair, and the four, ostrich, feather crown, snake-headed gab, the personification of the two ladies, the fertile black earth and the red desert, also wearing the punt beard, and green-skinned Osiris son of gab, god of the afterlife, the underworld, and the dead, wearing the atef crown, a tall bulbous white he jet crown with two red and blue ostrich feathers on either side, which curl or curve at the upper ends, it was also wearing the punt beard. Desada said to Faustus, referencing Baint Jadet, the penis, testicles, and their semen, rather than the uterus, the vessel which receives and incubates the essence of life, were believed by the ancient Egyptians to house the primary creative power, thus, myths about masturbating monads, like Adam, ejaculating beings into existence are acts of spontaneous creation. Sitting at another table, Orpheus sat playing his kithara, harp, and singing a lamentation to his wife, Eurydice, who was holding a poisonous viper in her hands. Sitting with them, weeping crocodile tears, were the vengeful Irenaeus, three demonic virgins. Megara, the jealous one. Alecto, unceasing anger. And Tisiphon, avenging fury. The sisters were monstrous foul-smelling crones with bats' wings, coal-black bodies, and dogs' heads with bloodshot eyes, and having snakes for hair. Each carried a brass-studded scourge in their talon-fingered hands. They were vicious, cruel, and violent, and their victims always died in torment. Partially filled cups of venom were on the table before each of them. The Irenaeus were called Furies in Hell, Harpies on Earth, and Deary in Paradise. Orpheus was singing about how human souls were divine and immortal but doomed to live, for a time, in a grievous cycle of successive bodily lives through palingenetic metempsychosis and transmutation of the soul. Faustus and his companions had to pass between the two tables, and he couldn't help but overhear Anchises telling Aeneas of how everything that exists, even the sky, the land, the waters, the sun, moon, and stars, as well as the living creatures, were permeated with a living spirit. And how, when a spirit becomes part of a living thing, the body pollutes the spirit, clouding its vision. Standing between the two tables was Mistress Despoine Prosperina, wife of dark-bearded King Hades of the Underworld, the ruler of the dead, she was a formidable, venerable, and majestic queen in hell, here she stood, now, holding a golden bow in her hands, delicately examining it with a smile on her taunt cold blue-black lips. On her one side stood the implacable black-winged mistress Agonippe Demeter the mare, broad of face and broad of eyes, dressed in an achiton and bearing a sheave of poppies in her arms, wearing a horned diadem and having the ghosts of small birds flirting about her, eating poppy seeds out of her black, dreaded hair. On her other side stood square-jawed and broad-shouldered Korah, the younger of the three, 
wearing an elegant red himadion draped over a blue chitin, her face heavily painted with cosmetics, with red lips and black eyes, wearing a crown in her elaborately braided chest length red hair fanning out over her chest and shoulders. Nearby stood the incomprehensible Oracle Dephobe, the dark-haired Sybil of Kumi, who uttereth prophecies, holding back the voiceless ghost of blonde-haired Dido, the devotional fires of true love's flaming desire still burning within her blue eyes, so that she could not approach her one true love, an unrequited love, her love of Aeneas, who had rejected her. Standing in a crowd watching the spectacle of Dephobe restraining Dido were, Romulus, the founder of Rome, Julius Caesar, called the Queen of Bithynia, wearing a bloodstained toga with a Tyrian purple border, he had been stabbed twenty-three times, and Caesar Augustus, wearing a toga with the end piece pulled over his head and a short-sleeved tunica underneath. The toga was draped over his left shoulder, covering his arm and gracefully fell around his body, as well as Marcellus, Augustus' sixteen-year-old nephew, who looked glum, for having died so young. Even in death, the spirit retains traces of its old life, Anchises was saying. The dead souls of must spend a good deal of time, sometimes up to thousands of years, being purified, sometimes involving torments, so that they can clear their vision. Sitting at another table, nearby, were Aeschylus, the father of tragedy, and Euripides, the most tragic of poets, both men were bearded and wearing knee-length chitons fastened over their left shoulder, and sitting between them was a sensuous, androgynous youth with bright pink skin and rosy cheeks, Dionysius Eleutherios the Liberator, wearing a wreath crown of green grape leaves and thorny red roses wrapped around his head, so that the thorns caused blood to trickle down his face, and a fox. Skin loincloth, he was drunk and spilt wine from a Lycurgus cage cup, or dieteridum, which Faustus noticed shimmered green although the light which passed through it was tinted red. Dionysius' mother, the virgin Semele Thione, a fiery plasma-like woman form of heavenly purifying fire, having a deep bosom and flowing locks of flame, sat by her son, her arm around him, as she lustfully licked at his earlobes, kissing his flushed cheeks, her breath like thunderbolts, pure and holy. She was wearing a diadem, like a Tesla coil, discharging electric energy, surrounding her head like a halo. Their table, and the area around them, was crowded with bearded satyrs with erections and beautiful monades wearing white silk ribbons knotted about their heads, these were embroidered with cult images of bulls, fig trees, and animal sacrifices, the two long fringed end strips hanging down over their shoulders, they were all dressed in fawn skins and carried long fennel, thyrsus, sticks wrapped in ivy or vines and tipped with pine cones or snakes in their hands, and Cantharo's cups filled with wine, milk, and honey, and blood. Although the buxom, sweet-voiced women were beautiful, they were brutes, whirling, screaming, madly dancing in frenzied states of intoxication to the sounds of invisible drums, flutes, and cymbals. Agave was among them, carrying her son's lion-maned head on a stick. Three beautiful dark-haired, bat-winged maidens, the Miniades, Alcatho and Arsip and Losip, tossed a boy's head from one to the other, it was the head of Losip's son, Hippasus. Auden and Eno the white goddess of the beautiful ankles, Agave's sisters, danced with them. As he was led through the throng, Faustus was pushed so that he fell to sit at the table. The men merely ignored him, continuing their discussion as if weren't even there. He who learns must suffer, said Aeschylus. And even in our sleep pain that cannot forget falls away drop by drop upon the heart, and in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. The greatest pleasure of life is love, Euripides said. Love is all we have, the only way that each can help the other. And there is no pain so great as the memory of joy in present grief, said Aeschylus. No one can confidently say, said Euripides, that he will still be living tomorrow. Yes, Aeschylus said, it would be better to die once and for all than to suffer pain for all one's life. In the world, Euripides said, imprisoned men and women destroy each other daily by the intensity of their loves and hates. Theseus, the slayer of the Minotaur, 
and the hero who had once stolen Helen of Sparta, when she was but nine years of age, and Heracles were standing in an open area by a large stone with what looked like a statue sitting upon it, but it wasn't a statue, it was a mortal man, Pirithus, turned to rock, through his own hubris, and stuck there forever. All three were wearing white linothorax cuirass over their torsos, short pants, and bronze greaves on their shins and bronze arm guards. Heracles also had the impenetrable skin of the Nemedian lion tied over one shoulder. None of them had on helmets nor carried weapons. An idolon of Psyche, the most beautiful woman in the world, a pregnant virgin, her having butterfly wings like stained glass was sitting on a rough stone, alone and weeping tears that sparkled like diamonds. Hers was the human soul which is purified by sufferings and misfortune, and thus prepared for the enjoyment of true and pure happiness. Psyche was pregnant with Hedon Voluptus, pleasure, the personification of lust, and Cupido Zero son of Venus slash Aphrodite was the father. There is no illustration of the immortality of the soul more beautiful, than the butterfly, said Desada, seeing Faustus obsess over the grieving goddess. It bursts from the tomb in which it has lain on brilliant wings, after a dull, groveling caterpillar existence, to flutter about the blaze of day and feast on the most fragrant and delicate nectars of the spring. This said, they continued on, Desada leading, the two girls, Eponine and Azelma on either side of him, and Faustus, dumbly following after Desada. Came a parade of folks in their passage going betwixt the tables of adulterers without so acknowledging each t other, came and went a party of such notables as as follows. Great soldiers from antiquity around an equestrian soldier walking beside a Roman girl, her sitting aside upon a donkey and him holding her hand, she was Clolia the escaped hostage of Lars Porsna. Spartacus. Alexander the Great and his half-sister Canaan. Clovis. Sviatoslav I of Kiev. Timur the Mongol. Shepherd King David. Shalasha, whose name meant three. Jashab Bashabith son of Thakamoni. And so too came the commanders of the king's bodyguard. Abishai. Benaiah. Asahel. Job, the commander-in-chief of the whole of the forces. Benaiah son of Jehoiada the priest. Itai the Gittite. Adno the Itznight. Shagmer. Eliezer son of Dodo, Dode, the Ahohite and Shama son of Aji the Hararite. A gaggle of women were in train of a lady's passage, O Saint Theodora the Empress from the brothel whom was born in dire poverty her holding hands with Hypatia the Egyptian and Sappho of Lesbos. These dignified sluts were as follows. Queen Gwendolyn, Jaundoloina. Shamuramit, Semiramis. Timorous. Artemisia I of Caria. Siphonus Ba, a Carthaginian. Chiomara, a Gaul princess. Cardamandua. Boudica. Velida. Hind al Hunnid. Ethelberg of Wessex. Ethelfled, Lady of the Merkians. Queen Emma of France. Saint Olga of Kiev. Frades Irix Dotir. Matilda of Tuscany, the Great Countess. Uraka of Leon and Castile fighting with her half-sister Teresa, Countess of Portugal. Gwenly and Furch Gruffid. Melis and, Queen of Jerusalem. Sibylla, Queen of Jerusalem. Eleanor of Castile. Isabella of Aragon, Queen of France. In their wake, seemed be that everyone at all the different tables had changed places, or been replaced by others unseen and yet unknown, or else empty so that whereas one person sat but a blink ago was no one. Crowded around one table are prophets, oracles, and mystic, including Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezra, Daniel, Nostradamus, Edgar Casey, Polish nun Felix Sokoslowski, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Ovid, Petrarch, and Saint Malachi, Joseph Smith, and his older brother Hiram Smith, Mormons, Saint Photonai, and her five sisters, Anatole, Photo, Photis, Paraskeev, and Kyriake, Samaritans, 
At the table were sitting Jesus, Enoch and a bleeding nun. Enoch, who was a descendant of Cain, was wearing a red robe and a blue cloak. Jesus the Christ was dressed in nothing but a dirty, stained loincloth, his crown of thorns, his face streaming with dried blood, his nearly naked body scarred by the lash and covered in black and blue bruises and blood red welts, which were more black because of the dried blood crusted to his flesh, there was also a terrible wound in his left side from which seeped water mixed with blood, and his hands and feet had sore looking gaping holes through them. Seated at a table with them is the bleeding nun of the castle of Lindenburg and she tells them her story, see the monk, a romance by Matthew Lewis. Sitting with Jesus, Enoch, and the bleeding nun are, Mani, Zoroaster, Buddha, and Krishna. Mani, a Persian known as Shuriak, or Cabricus in Latin, his countenance peaceful and shining with love, was dressed in white baggy cotton trousers, sirwal, which was simple embroidered at the cuffs, under an ankle-length white cotton garment with long sleeves, thob, and a white cotton kafiya, head scarf, with a black eagle, cord, keeping it in place. Zoroaster, a turbaned magician with a barsum, a bundle of short brass rods, in hand, and wearing a white cotton sudra, nightgown, with a braided cincture, belt of sash, wrapped three times around his waist and tied in a square knot. Gautama Buddha the Enlightened One, also known as Siddhartha, wrapped in saffron robes, was talking with the monkey king, Sun Wukong, who was wearing blue pants, a red tunic and a yellow scarf tied around his neck, and a golden ring around his head. A blue-skinned four-armed avatar, Krishna, also sat with them, he had milky white eyes and a red thilaka in the middle of his forehead, running down from his hairline to the tip of his nose, this having a white edge all around it, in the shape of a U. Ostentatiously attired, he wore a peacock feather was on his head, a garland of brightly colored lotus flowers hung around his neck, and he was playing a flute. He wore silver bells tied around his ankles, a yellow colored dhoti, skirt, covering his legs and knotted at the waist, and a yellow upper cloth, tied with a silver girdle. His bracelets and armbands were made of jewels set in a net of gold. He also wore gold in his nose and gems on his fingers, and ear ornaments that swung against his cheeks. Saint Long Inu stood by Christ, wearing a cassis helmet and lorica segmentata scale armor over a scarlet tunic, with manica on his arms and greaves on his legs, his neck was wrapped in a scarlet focal, scarf, and a wool sagum, which had been saturated in lanolin to make it waterproof, fastened by a fibula, safety pin-like brooch. On his feet he wore hobnailed, leather caligai, laced up the center of the foot to the ankle. He wore brachy, short woolen trousers, over subligaria, underpants, and a pterygis, a skirt of metal studded leather strips. A pujo dagger and a short gladius sword were both sheathed and hanging from his ball to his sword belt. In his hands he held a asta, a thrusting spear with a six foot long ash pole and an iron spear head, blood dripping from its tip, the same spear with which he had pierced Christ's side on the cross, the same spear which the poor grail knight Sir Balin L.E. Savage, of the two swords, used to deliver the Dolorous stroke to King Pelham, the Grail King. Long Enus had been slowly going blind, but after spearing Christ some of his holy blood fell upon his eyes and washed away the blindness, instantly he could see well again. The bleeding nun's tale was interrupted by Saint Faustina, Sister Josepha Menendez, a coadjutrix sister of the Society of the Sacred Heart, an insignificant mystic who was dressed in the religious habit of a Roman Catholic nun, an elaborately starched white cotton coif and wimple and gamp, and a stiff black card covering was worn over the coif to prevent it from becoming wet or soiled, a black veil pinned to the headwear and turned up over her head to expose a white underveil covering her face, her holy habit, a loose dress made of blue-black serge fabric pleated at the neck and draping to the ground, with two sets of sleeves, a belt made of woven black wool was tied around her waist, she was also wearing two underskirts, which could not be seen a top skirt of black serge trimmed with cord and bottom skirt of black cotton, a monastic scapular, symbolic apron, hung, both front and back, from her shoulders, being tied under the belt, and in white apron. 
Her black leather shoes were simple, functional, a rosary of wooden beads and metal links hung from the belt by small hooks, a small silver cross hung from a black cord around her neck, and a simple silver ring was on her left hand. She also carried a large wooden cross and a holy Bible in her hands. Saint Faustina, in her own modest way, was speaking out on the tortures of hell, and was saying, the first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of God, the second is perpetual remorse of conscience, the third is that one's condition will never change, the fourth is that the fire will penetrate the soul without destroying it, a terrible suffering, since it is a purely spiritual fire, lit by God's anger, the fifth torture is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell, and, despite the darkness, the devils, and the souls of the damned see each other and all the evil, both of the others and their own, the sixth torture is the constant company of Satan, the seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses and blasphemies. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together, but not the end of the sufferings. There are special tortures designed for particular souls, these are the torments of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable suffering, related to the manner in which they lived, and sinned. O oh Jesus, cried out Faustus, overcome with emotion. I would rather be in agony until the end of the world, amidst the greatest of sufferings, than offend you by the least of my sin. O oh holy and blessed Dame, the perpetual comfort of humankind, who by thy bounty and grace nourish all the world, laughed Asada, shaking his fist at the nun, and hearest a great affection to the adversities of the miserable, as a loving mother you takest no rest, nor are you idle at any time in giving your benefits, succoring all men, his laughter overtook him so that he could finally say no more. Meanwhile, as Elma spat at her, flipping her the bird. Eponine called out, does your cuckold husband know you're here with these fuckers, slut? Faustus responded, quoting Psalms 114,3, saying, The sorrows of death have compassed me, and the perils of hell have found me. Psalms 114,3 The two girls were laughing as they dragged Faustus away from the scene, which had so captivated the mortal man of flesh. As Elma said to Faustus, without contraries is no progression. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate, are all necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven. Evil is hell. My friend, Bon Ami, said Dasada, putting his arm around Faustus and forcibly carrying him away, come, come, we must find a table, there is no time to waste on foolish dalliance listening to the ravings of lunatics who try and pass themselves off as messiahs, when all the lying hypocrites really are in the first place is despotic little bipolar schizophrenics. Laura Bell, a whore with a heart of gold, passed them by full of cheer, bearing a platter of delicacies to a nearby table whereat was seated the Frankish princess Basina daughter of Chilperic I and Clotilda daughter of Shari Bert I. At three tables set up around a statue of Isai's Philostergos, Queen of Aldebaran, and her daughter and granddaughter, seated at them, moving randomly about from one table to the other, socializing with each other, were. Having pushed several togethers into a swastika-like maze, many boisterous men and women of the Third Reich were in gathered together some seated, some standing on the floor, sometimes dancing on the tables, drinking, and making merry, these folk were as follows. Martin Bormann and his younger brother S.S. Gruppenführer Albert Bormann. Admiral Karl Jesko von Puttkamer. Dr. Hugo Blaschke, a dentist. And Rudolf Haas. S.S. Gruppenführer Hans Bauer. Hannah Reich, wearing the Iron Cross First Class and the Luftwaffe Pilot Observer Badge in gold with diamonds. Field Marshal Robert Ritter von Grimm. SS Brigade Führer Wilhelm Monk. SS Gruppenführer Johann Rattenhuber. Joining these heroic Germanic knights of the True Maltese Cross were their secretaries. Trodel Jung. Gerda Deranowski, Christian. Els Kruger. Walter Hewell, an agent of the Ebwehr. 
and also with them was Constance Manzi Arley, a cook dietitian, Reichspresident, President, Karl Donitz, Alfred Jodl, Dr. S.S. Standartenführer Ernst Gunther Schenk, wearing the Iron Cross Second Class, Dr. S.S. Obersturm Banführer Werner Hasse, Dr. Helmut Kuhns, a dentist, Nurse Erna Flegel, Nurse Lizalati Chervinska, Werner Naumann, Dr. S.S. Obersturm Banführer Ludwig Stumpfegger, Reichsjugendführer Arter Axmann, leader of the Hitler Youth, SS Standartenführer Julius Schreck. SS Obersturm Banführer Erich Kempa sat with them wearing a Totenkopf ring on his right index finger, his hand resting on the hilt of an SS Erendigen honor sword, the black wooden handle was ribbed and featured a shining steel D-shaped knuckle bow, cross guard, bound with silver wire and inset disc, which featured the SS double lightning bolt rune. The scabbard was also painted black and had a silver decorative silver top, locket, and bottom, shape, mounts. The long thin sword blade having been made to accommodate the height of the wearer. SS Hauptscharfuhrer Heinrich Duess, a driver. SS Obersturm Banführer George Betz and Kath Hauser Mann, a dental surgeon, were kissing each other tenderly, unabashed of the public spectacle. Faustus, Desada, Eponin and Azelma were seated at a table with six other men, Darcy John Bouchard, Eric Nemudis, Dady O4 Cube, Gigno Schmuertz, and Sam Dups, who were sitting together listening to Citizen Mayfly harangue on about the plausibility of the death of the immortal soul and the politics of the hierarchical and totalitarian politics of hell. They were joined by two women, Hilda Morell, British, and Karen Silkwood, American. A Swedish siren commands her slave girls to serve them, these speaking as they serve the platters, naming the delicacies, saying, yolks of eggs, cockstones, lobsters, crayfish, periwinkles, oyster pies, beef marrow, corn and potatoes spiced with coriander, erangos, sweet wine, and skiritroots have a great deal of spermatic virtue. Food is the first thing, said Desada, morals follow. Eponine and Azelma each kissed him lustily in turn, then each took up one of Faustus' hands and led him away, leaving Desada to indulge his appetites. More old wine called out Desada, sitting down at the table. To hell with this new stuff. Then, after his mastoy had been filled by a server, he barked out a toast, to Saint Ida's dove, may it shit on her head. And to hell with Leo Ba the Miraculous. To hell with Leo Ba the Prude, another of the gents present at his table replied. That Rue is Giacomo Casanova, Count of Ferrussi, Chevalier de Sengal the Sybarite, Eponine said. La Esmeralda the Gypsy, wearing a paste emerald around her neck danced around the tables with her tambourine, drumming it and jingling its tiny cymbals, followed by her clever goat jelly. Miriam the Chant Rest danced with her, slapping her timbrel against her hip, and these two were identified by the elder sister, as well. O.C. Lothario is there with his friend Anselmo's wife, Camilla, said Azelma, and her maid. A green fairy named Mal White was filling earthenware jugs from a large wooden barrel with a green nectar, distilled from wormwood, hyssop, and melissa, and spiced with fennel. These were picked up and carried by various other serving wenches to the tables, some of the other women also serving the tables including Luck Barons, Elizabeth Lawrence, and Katharina Meyer Summer. I hope you like this, Absinthe, said Desada to Faustus. Leo de V, or Water of Life. Elizabeth of Doberschutz came and served them drinks, pouring the green liquid into empty goblets already on the table before them. Desada took one and instantly downed it in gulp. Ah! The universal pan crest. Said Desada, happily holding out his goblet for more. The remedy to all diseases and elixir of immortal youth. I can't drink this poison, spat out Faustus, spewing the absinthe out as quickly as he'd tasted it. In her past life, Desada casually mentioned, taking the goblet from out of Faustus' hand and drinking heartily, this fine wench was beheaded and burnt as a sorceress, and a poisoner, 
but I assure you, sir, that there is absolutely nothing wrong with the green fairy. See that poor old woman, said Eponine of Anarolefs. She was tortured, found guilty of maleficium and diabolism in league with the devil, condemned, beheaded and burnt, as well. They were among the last of the witches to be treated so. Said Eponine, unable to contain her empathy for the witches, so horribly by their communities. For some strange reason, said Dasada, they were chosen by their peers as scapegoats, who attributed to them what they could not accept in themselves. And there is Kate McNiven, the witch of Mencia, said Azelma. She was a healer and prophetess, but that didn't stop them from treating her to fire and faggot. The toilets. Excuse, Monsieur Satoyan, said Faustus, lowly, so that only Dasada could hear him, but where is it that you, uh, I, uh, just where am I supposed to relieve myself? Follow me, my friend, said Dasada, and he led him away. Along the way Faustus noticed a loose group of souls wandering aimlessly in circles around the twisted mess of Speleothem, seemingly avoiding each other. Faustus asked Dasada, who are these lonely people? Those are the apostates, said Dasada. No one trusts them, in the world they were spies and double agents. Who knows where their true loyalties lie? My God! Faustus remarked, do you mean to tell me that these expatriated souls are ostracized and unwelcome everywhere? They are welcome to wander the black road alone, spewed out Dasada, loud enough for anyone near them to hear. No one wants them here. Finally, they arrived at a dark grotto recessed in a faraway wall of the cavern which was pitched in Stygian darkness. Here we are, he said. The toilets, as you requested. Two men were fighting just inside the toilet entrance, the one was Dr. Theodore Morel, der Reich Spritzenmeister, who was disgustingly obese and unhygienic, wearing a dirty, gray suit and a white shirt, but no tie, the other was Dr. Carl Brandt, who had removed his gray suit jacket, this on the ground nearby, and had his white shirt sleeves, cuffs unbuttoned and rolled up to just below his elbows. Brandt punched Morel, who fell backwards onto his ass, a variety of pills and needles fell out of his jacket pockets, which he tried to grab up. You dirty pig! I should throw you into the toilet, said Brandt gruffly, like we did to, Eckhard, Christian. No. Don't, whimpered Morel, still gathering up the pills picking them up one by one. I have served my fatherland as others before me. Before he could finish speaking, Brandt kicked him hard in the side of the head and Morel slumped down amongst the pills and needles, unconscious. Then, without much ado, he turned and walked away, passing Dasada and Faustus, and exiting the chamber. This is the place that we dispose of the human waste which wanders into our midst, said Dasada, somewhat amused. We might be fooled by some for a time, but in the end no one can keep their true selves hidden, the enemies of the people are weeded out damn quick, brought here, and thrown into the gaping chasm, to fall down into the shit pit where they belong. Faustus shuddered at the thought, then as he proceeded forward cautiously feeling his way into the darkness to poop over the edge of the pit, and he had a terrible thoughts, what if something was down there, just waiting for him, to crawl up and drag him down to a fate worse than death? Or what if he fell in and Asada just left him there? Dasada, meanwhile, was laughing, talking on and on about the cruel fate that had befallen the many unwanted souls which had the misfortune of wandering among them, saying, this is where we threw the five Moranos who invented the South American Indian slave trade, and betrayed Cristofro Colombo, also a Jew. Alonso de la Calle. Luis de Torres. Gabriel Sanchez. Marco. And. Bernal. Note. The Jews were expelled from Spain on August 2, 1492, and from Portugal in 1497. Many of these Jews emigrated to Holland, where they set up the Dutch West Indies Trading Company, and the Dutch East Indies Trading Company, to exploit the New World. Manasseh Ben Israel and his brother-in-law David Abravanel Dormito, who resettled the Jews in England during Cromwell's reign, are down there, 
2. As are the Zionists Meyer Emschel Bauer opened, Rothschild, and his five sons, who took control of the British economy after the Battle of Waterloo, who dominate and enslave the whole goddamned world to the Babylonian Talmud loving Jews. Faustus, on hearing the name Rothschild, remembered the terrible vision of the damned souls in the cauldron of shit which was the devil's belly, and, shuddering at the grim recollection, he almost lost his footing, stumbled, and fell, into the shit pit. Desada merely continued his monologue, unconcerned as to whether or not he was heard or listened to, saying, Jacob Barsimson, the first Jew to emigrate from Holland to New Amsterdam, New York. And Haman Levy. Nicholas Lowe, and Joseph Simon, who debauched and corrupted the peaceful North American Indians by trading smallpox infected blankets and firewater, resulting in the massacre of many an innocent colonist, setting race relations back to the time of the Babylon captivity and Egyptian bondage. And the Monsanto family of Louisiana. Benjamin. Isaac. Manuel. Eleonora. Garcia. And. Jacob. Not to mention those faggot kook sockering Dutch race traders, Jan Huygen van Linschoten and Cornelis de Houtman, and the Flemish Willem Usselinex. All of them, profiteers who exploited the civil unrest led by Oliver Cromwell, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, the American Civil War, and the Russian Revolution. De Sada urged Faustus towards a seepage of water in the rocks, whereof was a stinking fetid puddle of brackish water and paper stained with bodily waste, which streamed away in a small trickle into a hole but some also spilled over the edge into the pit of. Shush said De Sada quietly, list yeah, wash your bum here, after a poop it's good to clean your bum otherwise you're beneath the animals. And wash your hands. A dirty bum is never ever any real fun, my man. Then Desada began to hum, giggle and guffaw, and outright laugh, and with much mirth continued, half singing and half speaking, but gleeful nonetheless, following Jews all being well-known dealers, owners, shippers, or supporters of the slave trade and of the enslavement of black African citizens in early New York history were in a group, struggling with each other and bickering and haggling over the price of a small white boy with the red hair, and freckles, and wearing a makeshift diaper fashioned of a soft, green clover. They were arguing over whose it was and how much it was worth and who should buy it for what price and they were bickering and that price kept getting lower and lower as they continually devalued the poor wee soul. Some argued that it wasn't worth a penny part of a farthing and others decreed it tax to greatest extent, yet none valued the wee specimen not at all. There were as follows. Antonio Anthony Johnson, the first black slave owner in America, his wife Mary, their son Richard Johnson and two daughters. Yet. Get this. John Kaser, the first legal slave for life in Virginia, America, was owned in perpetuity by Antonio. Desada bowed, letting the last bit of paper fall out of his hand as he spoke, saying. May they all writhe in hell forevermore, Desada commented as Faustus re-emerged from the darkness, having hanged his rear end over the vacuous pit to perform his dirty business, thus satisfying the mortal needs of his flesh. Ah my friend, said Desada. Quickly, let us back to festivities at the banquet. There is yet much revelry to exasperate ourselves. Authors note. Thus began they their exit of that dismal dreary place the toilet in the great banquet hall of hell. In short order, the two men had returned they them to their ladies, whom sat impatiently partaking of the green fairy and not much inclined to notice or acknowledge their menfolk's return. Sleepy Hypnose, a young man with lips as soft as powder and cold as snow, having wings on his shoulders and scarlet poppies in his hair, who was drinking from a horn filled with an opium tincture mixed with waters drawn from the river Lethe, came and sat with Faustus. His beloved Polystheia sat by him, his free hand held in hers. Their black winged son, Morpheus, joined them and poured Faustus a drink from an earthenware jug, unbeknownst to him, it contained sleep, dreams, fear and death. Morpheus' twin brother then Eidos, death, sat with them, as well. As did their younger siblings, the triplets, the Oniroi, 
Phobiter, scary dreams, a huge and scary animal of a man, fantasis, illusion, and I close, realistic true dreams. Beautiful and kind Queen Alcestis of Thessaly, who sacrificed herself for love, was made to sit on Thanatos' lap, his arm around her, enjoying forcing her companionship. She did not struggle, though, but was resigned to her fate. She was naked and he was groping her nubal flesh, caressing and pinching her tits, pulling on her nipples. It wasn't long before the drug, and the company, had their way with Faustus. His eyelids grew heavy, drooping, fluttering between being open and closed, his vision was hazy and blurred, he began seeing double, then trails. His mind was reeling as he lost all sensory depth perception, things which were far away seemed close and things which were close seemed far away, the things he was thinking of, even passing thoughts, took on form, swirling in the air around him, voices and faces from his memory, some emerging from the long-forgotten recess of his unconsciousness, also took on form, but the shapes had no permanence and dissolved just as easily as they came into being. His most intimate thoughts and secrets seemed to be laid before the company at the table with him. His thoughts began to resound within his mind, amplifying, reverberating, echoing, fading in and out, repeating over and over, sounding backwards within his mind. He grew dizzy, his mind reeling in the throes of the hallucinogen which had been secretly administered to him. The last thing Faustus was aware of was a silent thought, or was it someone speaking to him, saying, you're old enough to know better than to trust strangers, asshole. And cold, cruel laughter. The room and everything in it was spinning, the colors swirling and the shapes distorting, then, dropping his glass from his hand, he fell face first into the table, asleep, or crucified somewhere betwixt sleep and dreams. Faustus first dream. Faustus dreamed that he rose up from where he had passed out at the table, a wandering somnambulist, he staggered to the shit pit, but when he raised his robe and exposed his buttocks to the chill, to do his dirty business, he fell backwards into the pit. He fell into the utter darkness, flailing his limbs and screaming in terror, and after a while he landed in the muck with a splat, sunk at once, and disappeared into the fecal waste. Struggling for the surface, his head emerged from the sea of filth, gasping for breath. He could feel other bodies in the shit with him, clawing at him, grabbing at him, and pulling him back down into the foul crap. Struggling, he freed himself, and broke the surface again, gasping for breath. Striking out and kicking at the others he finally managed to tread the cesspool. Wiping the shit from his eyes, as best he could, he saw fiery bright angelic beings pulling bodies from the stinking, reeking shit, then, without warning, he felt gentle hands take hold of him and pull him up out of the shit. But, hardly had he begun to be lifted up, when the others in the excrement grabbed at him, pulling him back in. Thus, there was a tug of war between the two forces, with Faustus being pulled apart between them. Kicking out savagely in a fury he finally freed his legs from the others, and was raised up out of the shit by the fiery bright angelic beings, and as he was so uplifted, his soggy soiled robe began to singe and smolder and burn away until he was naked, his soft white flesh glowing and more and more taking on the appearance of a bright glowing flame in the darkness. Thus, Faustus transcended, transforming into a fiery bright angelic being himself, and so it was that he joined in freeing other filthy wretches from drowning in the shit. He took one poor soul by the arm and raised him out of the cesspool, and looking into the man's face he saw himself. Horrified, his grip loosened, and he, or rather the image of himself, was dragged back under the shit. Then, of its own volition, his flame extinguished, and he fell back into the shit with a splash, submerged, struggled to the surface, beating off the others as he did before and calling out for rescue and redemption. After a while, another fiery bright angelic being took hold of him and raised him up out of the defiling corruption, only to have him pulled back in or fall back in time after time in a never-ending repeating process. At last, Faustus managed to free himself, and to flaming flutter over the wormy scum as one of the fiery bright angelic beings. 
but, like Icarus who flew too near the sun, his ambitious heart overwhelmed him and he burned too hot. In a heart's beat he flared up and, in the silence, extinguished, such that he was neither flying, falling, nor floating. Faustus merely endured as a disembodied sentience, persisting in being, then, like a flame pulsating and shivering in a breeze, he extinguished, and it became as if he were not being. There was neither blackness nor light, no sounds, no feelings, no thoughts, no emotions, mere existence without the presence of reality, such that he experienced no passage of time. He neither existed nor ceased to exist. The emptiness within him contained him, and became nothing, an unbeing not existing. In essence, he forgot himself completely. As soon as he lost himself, Faustus reanimated, it was as if he'd been reborn in the womb, except the embryo which contained him was the shit and piss and bloody waste within the pit. His eyes burned as they flashed open, his mouth and nostrils filling with the disgusting semi-fluid excreta. Having no buoyancy, neither sinking nor rising, his arms thrashing wildly, he swam, knowing not if he was swimming for the surface or deeper into the cesspool. Then, bursting through the surface, gasping for breath, the filth seeping down his throat and into his mouth so that he was coughing, Faustus was transformed into a creeping, crawling multi-armed worm. Then he was walking on the wet bog, and crawling up the craggy rock face, it became as if he was disembodied, not watching, but aware of the slimy shit-covered worm that he was, and how he had crawled out of the sewer, even of how he was the sleepwalker approaching the edge of the shit pit, stepping on the worm and squishing it, and of dying thusly, and of being the man, falling into the pit. Even as this was happening he awoke, sweating and screaming. Our sixth story continues in the next part, called The Second Day of Damnation. <laughs>